half a day. My name is Dawn Lees Regis and welcome to my presentation, Symbols and Images of the Feminine. This project encompasses eight separate presentations designed to share with the viewer how women have been represented in art through the ages. They are Goddess, Temptress, Flora, Fauna and Food, Idyllic and Fragile, Death and Martyrdom, Lust and Voyeurism, Pinned Up, Pinned Down and Pain, and Vagina Dentata and the Fear of the Feminine. Why, you might ask, should we care about how women's images are portrayed in art? Because seeing is believing. We believe what we can be based on what we see. We define our lives around what we see and hear. We dream and imagine and make plans based on the examples that we're presented with. And we must pay attention to what we feed our souls through our eyes and our ears. Artists create from their own level of understanding. They imbue their work with their life circumstances, with their fears and concerns, and with their own specific experiences. In each presentation, I will share some images, give you a little background on the work, and tell some stories where it seems important. And I'll do my best to present without too much judgment. And so, let's begin. In this presentation, you'll see how the depiction of dead women leads us to believe that dying is a noble pursuit. The depiction of death has been interpreted as sleep, which is a connotation of physical abandonment and vulnerability, suggesting sexual fulfillment or a metaphor for virginity. Fairy tales, such as Sleeping Beauty or Snow White, have traditionally depended upon this association. Each story a symbol of the perfect feminine passivity. Death is also one of the more frequently employed poetic metaphors for orgasm. Marietta Robusti lived between 1560 and 1590 and was the daughter of Jacopo Tintoretto. So very proud of Marietta was Tintoretto that he dressed her as a boy and educated her in art and music. Marietta had talent and for 15 years worked tirelessly in her father's studio. Her abilities were well known throughout Venice and eventually she was asked by the King of Spain and the Emperor of Austria to work for them. Despite his pride in his daughter, Tintoretto jealously declined permission for her to leave him or his studio. He decided to do her a big favor and marry her off to the head of a silversmith's guild, insisting that she remain in her father's service forever. Four years into her marriage, at the age of 30, Marietta died in childbirth. Following her death, Tintoretto's studio painting production was significantly decreased. Tintoretto insisted he had trouble painting due to his all-consuming grief. Let's just note here that the master of the studio has the right to sign all work coming from the studio as his own if he chooses. Tintoretto signed all of Maria Robusti's work. Historians claim that the work of father and daughter is nearly indistinguishable. I don't want to diminish a person's grief at losing a child, but I'd like to suggest here that perhaps production in the studio decreased significantly, in large part because Tintoretto lost his most able painter. And let's just wonder for a moment how different the story might have been had Maria been allowed to follow her career as a man might have and gone off to be a court painter. The Lady of Shallot is a lyrical ballad by the English poet Alfred Tennyson, which tells the tragic story of Elaine of Astolat, a young noblewoman imprisoned in a tower up the river from Camelot. One of the poet's best known works, its vivid medieval romanticism and enigmatic symbolism inspired many painters. Tennyson wrote two versions of the poem. The revised version has a significantly different ending designed to match Victorian morals regarding gender norms and the act of suicide. Feminist critics see the poem as concerned with issues of women's sexuality and their place in the Victorian world. Critics argue that the Lady of Shallot centers on the temptation of sexuality and her innocence preserved by death. Christine Polson discusses a feminist viewpoint and suggests the Lady of Shallot's escape from her tower is an act of defiance a symbol of feminine empowerment. 
Based on Paulson's view, escaping from the tower allows for the Lady of Shallot to emotionally break free and come into terms with female sexuality. The depiction of death has also been interpreted as sleep. Paulson says that sleep has a connotation of physical abandonment and vulnerability, which can either suggest sexual fulfillment or be a metaphor for virginity. Built in 1600, the Bridge of Sighs is an enclosed bridge in Venice and connects a prison to interrogation rooms in the Doge's Palace. Gustave Doré places a beautiful woman on the precipice of the bridge, presumably planning to jump to her death. The character Ophelia represents femininity, and in the story, Hamlet is able to act out his aggression toward his mother on Ophelia. Although she is really a naive and innocent girl, Hamlet believes all women are manipulative and use their feminine nature to take advantage of men. Ophelia's death symbolizes a life spent passively tolerating Hamlet's manipulations and the restrictions imposed by those around her, while struggling to maintain the last shred of her dignity. Her apparent suicide denotes a desire to take control of her life for once. However, Queen Gertrude reports it as merely an accident, stating that Ophelia had climbed into a willow tree, that the branch had broken, and Ophelia fell into the water and drowned. This young woman is beautifully epitomized as a martyr, and we are somehow led to understand that death is a good thing. She is a saint, after all. It's hard to miss the binds on her arms that she could not have done herself, the placement of her hands, and the tilt of her head all sexual connotations. Leonor Fini is known as a surrealist painter and often presented strong female figures in her paintings. Anutil is translated as unnecessary or useless. This painting seems to me a direct commentary on women floating in water and why they would be. Note the vivid colors, the active paint, and the position of the hands. This piece shows a female figure that is purposely entering the water to obtain knowledge. The ribbons are loose and decorative as opposed to binding and restrictive. She is connected with her environment. These figures are made from Barbie dolls and bird bones, replacing the heads and other body parts. In my mind, these women have taken a spiritual trip of the mind to find their true selves and are traversing the ocean strong in their conviction to guide those who care to seek knowledge. Frida Kahlo has her own unique way of presenting death and her relationship with it. Death is an important and celebrated thing in Mexican culture. Death was also something that surrounded Frida in her near-death accident, in the loss of her child, and in the death of her marriage. The life cycle of the quilt and embroidery pattern known as Sunbonnet Sioux serves as a perfect example of the ways people have used one icon to serve lots of different purposes and express a lot of different views of the world. The original Sunbonnet Sioux stands for the stereotype of the prim, faceless good girl, often shown in quilts and embroidery images engaged in typical good girl activities such as watering flowers, playing with her dolly, or just standing around and looking cute. In the heat of the feminist movement of the 1970s, some quilters, feminists all, decided that Prissy Sue needed to die. From their collaboration came the quilt, The Sun Sets on Sunbonnet Sue. The quilt was composed of 20 panels, each quilter killing Sue off in a different way. Swallowed by a snake, hit by lightning, overdosing, falling in a cook pot, and the other various suicidal activities. With Sloth Sioux and Tough Sioux, these quilters challenge us to create our own Sunbonnet Sioux. What image would she assume for you? 15-year-old Agatha, from a rich and noble family, made a vow of virginity and rejected the amorous advances of a Roman ruler. In retaliation, she was stretched on a rack to be torn with iron hooks, burned with torches, and whipped. Amongst the tortures she underwent was the cutting off of her breasts with pinchers. After further dramatic confrontations with the Roman ruler, Agatha was then sentenced to be burned at the stake. As the fates would have it, an earthquake saved her, and instead she was sent to prison where St. Peter the Apostle appeared to her 
and healed her wounds. Once again, we see the strong message of men in a position of power over women, not only in the fact that she is nude, but also in a cautionary tale about refusing to give in. Her death and torture are immortalized, promoting the value of chastity. This is Lucretia, yet another virtuous heroine whose act of self-destruction after being raped is seen as a choice of death over dishonor. I guess plunging a dagger into her breast requires that clothing be moved aside, but the portrayal here is one of sensuality, not only in the exposed breast, but in the sensual garments as well. Her expression is really not one of someone about to gore herself. Her eyes are suggestive and the mouth is soft, even kissable. Notice the big difference in how Lucretia is presented with Artemisia Gentileschi. It's not hard to imagine, following her own experience of sexual violence, that Artemisia would have felt a particular empathy for this female hero. The tightly cropped composition brings us uncomfortably close to Lucretia's final moments. The heroine's parted lips and furrowed brow convey her sense of anguish and determination. Artemisia presents Lucretia not as a victim, but as a woman purposefully in charge of her own destiny. Here is Cleopatra committing suicide by snake. This is an example of the vulnerability through sex idea which the male imagination imposes upon the female. Why does Cleopatra need to be unclothed in order to kill herself? Why do her servants also need to be unclothed? This is a classic example of eroticism in death and once again shows how death is frequently employed as a poetic metaphor for orgasm. Compare the strength in this representation to the previous Kanyachi piece. Reclining in an isolated bedchamber, Cleopatra has just committed suicide following the death of her lover, Mark Antony. But rather than looking sexy in death, Artemisia paints her skin deathly pale and her lips are turning blue. In the background, Cleopatra's two maidservants, fully clothed and active, burst into the room just in time to see their queen expiring her last breath. One more story of a heroine willing to risk her life. But in this one, the woman plots to save her people. The recently married Jewish heroine Esther comes before her husband, the king of Persia, to entreat him to repeal a ruling that all Jews living in Persia should be massacred. Appearing before the king without being summoned was punishable by death, and Esther, having fasted for three days and considerably weakened, fainted in his presence. Instead of being punished, Esther was successful in overturning the decree and thus came to be viewed as a symbol of female courage. Local Guam artist Yoon Suk Park obtained her fine arts degree in Seoul, Korea. After marrying, she moved to Guam, where she has been an active participant in many notable art activities. She says this about her piece. The person sentenced by the judge appeared to acknowledge his or her guilt and repent. Repentance is a decision and a process of the mind. True repentance should be followed by good behavior. If the guilty person has truly repented, he will not have to appear before the judge again. In a few small nips, Frida Kahlo is expressing her pain over Diego's infidelities, in particular with her sister. Each of the small nips would be nothing by themselves, but when you put it all together, you end up with a bloody mess. Guam has its own death stories. This one, The Legend of the Flame Tree, is a story of Spanish influence and clearly mimics a Romeo and Juliet tale. I chose, however, to place magical and strong women in the water holding up the island as a reference to the strength of the island resting on the power of women. Thank you for joining me today. My one big hope is that from this presentation, you begin to see things through a more enlightened position, that you begin to look at images presented to you with a curious and open mind, and perhaps develop a healthy recognition that you don't have to absorb images as your own truth. You and you alone are responsible for your own truth.